Hi, everybody. Um, my name is John Washington, and I'm the public practice co-chair of the International Law Society. Um, on behalf of the International Law Society and the other um, sponsors of the event, which are the Law Students for Human Rights, the Muslim Law Students Association, and the Ahmadiyya Muslim Lawyers Association USA, um, I wanted to thank Mr. Rahman for being here with us today. Uh, he's in the middle of a whirlwind tour with several other, several other law schools, as well as the Library of Congress, so we're very uh, fortunate to have him with us. For many years, Mr. Rahman has been a tireless supporter of Ahmadis in Pakistan, um, defending hundreds of them against the anti-blasphemy laws which uh, persecute them. He's also argued before Pakistan's Supreme Court uh, in the landmark decision Zahiruddin v. State, um, in which he asserted that the anti-blasphemy laws were unconstitutional and incompatible with Pakistan's constitutional right for uh, freedom of religion. Mr. Rahman is also the author of several books, including Error at the Apex, which analyzes the Zahiruddin decision, and 1974, in-camera proceedings of the Special Committee, which examines the decision 40 years ago of the of Pakistan's National Assembly to declare Ahmadis as non-Muslims under the Pakistan Constitution. Mr. Rahman has also testified in, uh, to the U.S. and German governments about his work and international religious freedom and human rights. Um, with this brief introduction, I'd like to reiterate how happy we are to have him here with us today and pass the word to uh, Mr. Bhatti, who can do a better job um, uh, of introducing this to Thank you, Mr. Washington, for that introduction. On behalf of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Lawyers Association, United States of America, I am honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Mujibur Rahman. Now, to help put Mr. Rahman's remarkable background and contributions in their proper context, let me first provide a brief overview of who the Ahmadi Muslims are and the scope of the persecution that they endure. Now, founded in 1889, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is a revivalist movement within Islam. Ahmadi Muslims believe in the principal creed of Islam, which is the Kalima, and self-identify and profess to be Muslims. The fundamental ideological difference between mainstream Sunni Islam and the Ahmadiyya Muslim community concerns the identity of the reformer, a Mahdi, and the Messiah, a Masih, in Islam. Ahmadi Muslims believe that their founder, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, occupied both roles. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community is among the most persecuted Muslim communities in the world. The U.S. State Department, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, and dozens of human rights non-governmental organizations have documented the systematic persecution endured by Ahmadi Muslims at the hands of religious extremists and state and quasi-state institutions in numerous countries around the world. This includes Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Kazakhstan, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Libya, and Syria. Today, Mr. Rahman's talk will focus on Pakistan, which has become a particularly disturbing case study in religious intolerance and why state and religion should never mix. Researchers estimate that several million Ahmadi Muslims currently live in Pakistan. As I mentioned, Ahmadi Muslims self-identify as Muslims, but their belief is irrelevant under the law. That is because Pakistan is the only Islamic state in the world to define who is and who is not a Muslim as per its constitution in Article 260. <coughs> Think about our own U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights in comparison. Imagine if our Second Amendment said something like, a Christian is one who accepts Jesus as the Messiah and follows only his word. Any Mormon who claims to be Christian is not Christian for the purposes of this constitution or law. The Pakistan Constitution and its Second Amendment do just that. The Second Amendment passed exactly 40 years ago in 1974 amends Article 260 to say, quote, a person who does not believe in the absolute and unqualified finality of the prophethood of Muhammad, the last of the prophets, or claims to be a prophet in any sense of the word, or of any description whatsoever after Muhammad, or recognizes such a claimant as a prophet or religious reformer, is not a Muslim for the purposes of this constitution or law, end quote. This amendment then explicitly deprives Ahmadi Muslims of their right to self-identify as Muslims. As has been well chronicled by the international community, since 1984, Pakistan has used its criminal code to prohibit and punish blasphemy. Blasphemy in Pakistan broadly refers to any spoken 
or written representation that directly or indirectly outrages the religious sentiments of Muslims. Five of Pakistan's current penal code provisions punish blasphemy. These are collectively referred to as the anti-blasphemy laws. Over the course of 30 years, several thousand individuals have been arrested under these laws. These individuals were Muslims, Sunni, Shia, Ahmadis, as well as Christians and Hindus. Their crimes range from wearing an Islamic slogan on a t-shirt to printing a wedding invitation card with Quranic verses on it. Their punishments range from fines to indefinite detention to life imprisonment to the death sentence. Now, although no one to date in Pakistan has been ex executed for blasphemy, several dozen individuals have been killed by mobs after being arrested for blasphemy. The most notorious of Pakistan's anti-blasphemy laws is a 50-word penal code ordinance, which is called Section 295C. Whoever by words, either spoken or written, or by visible representation, or by any imputation, innuendo, or insinuation, directly or indirectly, defiles the sacred name of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, shall be punished with death or imprisonment for life, and shall also be liable to fine. My fellow colleagues, void for vagueness, anybody? Based on this remarkably broad language, virtually anyone can register a blasphemy case against anyone else in Pakistan, and the accused can face capital punishment. For Ahmadi Muslims, Pakistan's anti-blasphemy laws have essentially criminalized their very existence. Two of the five anti-blasphemy laws explicitly target by name the activities of Ahmadi Muslims. Now, these two laws are part of what is known as Martial Law Ordinance 20, which amended Pakistan's penal code and press publication ordinance sections 298B and 298C. So for fear of being charged with indirectly or directly posing as a Muslim, Ahmadi Muslims cannot profess their faith either verbally or in writing. Pakistani police have thus destroyed Ahmadi translations of the Quran and banned Ahmadi publications, the use of any Islamic terminology on Ahmadi Muslim wedding invitations, the offering of Ahmadi Muslim funeral prayers, and the displaying of the Islamic creed, the Kalima, on Ahmadi Muslim gravestones. In addition, Ordinance 20 prohibits Ahmadi Muslims from declaring their faith publicly, propagating their faith, building mosques, or making the call for Muslim prayers. In short, Virtually any public act of worship, devotion, or propagation by an Ahmadi Muslim can be treated as a criminal offense punishable by fine, imprisonment, or death. Not surprisingly, having suffered under the anti-blasphemy laws for years, religious minorities in Pakistan have challenged the constitutionality of the anti-blasphemy laws. Unfortunately, however, the anti-blasphemy laws have withstood legal scrutiny. In 1984, shortly after President Ziaul Haq enacted Ordinance 20, the Federal Sharia Court, which is the highest religious court in Pakistan, was asked to rule on the question of whether or not Ordinance 20 was contrary to the injunctions of the Quran and Sunnah, which is the practice of the Prophet Muhammad. Now the case was Mujibur Rahman versus the government of Pakistan, and Mr. Rahman was both the lead petitioner and the lead counsel. The court upheld the validity of Ordinance 20 and ruled that Parliament had acted within its authority to declare Ahmadi Muslims as non-Muslims. Now, on July 3, 1993, the Supreme Court of Pakistan dismissed eight appeals brought by Ahmadi Muslims who were arrested under uh, Ordinance 20 and Section 295C. The collective complaint in the case was Zahiruddin versus State. And that was uh, the 1984 Ordinance 20 violated the constitutional rights of religious minorities. The court dismissed the complaint on two main grounds. First, the court held that Ahmadi Muslim religious practice, however peaceful, angered and offended the Sunni majority in Pakistan. So to maintain law and order, Pakistan would therefore need to control Ahmadi Muslim religious practice. Second, Ahmadi Muslims having been deemed to be non-Muslims by law, could not use Islamic phrases or words or the like in public. Pakistan, the court reasoned, had the right to protect the sanctity of religious terms under these laws and the right to prevent their usage by non-Muslims under company and trademark laws. In light of these twin court decisions by the highest judicial bodies in Pakistan, Pakistan's anti-blasphemy laws remain a legitimate state-approved instrument for persecution of religious minorities, especially Ahmadi Muslims. As a consequence of the current legal apparatus criminalizing Ahmadi activities, Ahmadi Muslims have faced grave human rights 
violations. Now with this background, let me introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Majibur Rahman. Mr. Rahman is among Pakistan's most renowned lawyers and is a noted Islamic scholar and author. He's a senior advocate of the Pakistan Supreme Court and founder of his own law firm in Rawalpindi. Mr. Rahman graduated from the University of Punjab in 1957 and obtained his LLB from the University of Karachi in 1961. So for over 53 years, Mr. Rahman has argued hundreds of cases, including scores of cases before the Pakistan Supreme Court. Mr. Rahman has devoted the lion's share of his legal career to the cause of religious freedom and is referred by some as the Thurgood Marshal of Pakistan. He has defended hundreds of cases registered against Ahmadi Muslims under the anti-blasphemy laws, most notably in Zahiruddin, where five Ahmadi Muslims were charged for professing to be Muslims under Ordinance 20, which is specifically targeted towards Ahmadi Muslims. Mr. Rahman challenged the prosecution on the grounds that it violated the rights of religious freedom under Pakistan's constitution, that the law was discriminatory, vague, and overbroad. In the judicial history of Pakistan, Zahiruddin is a landmark judgment, and its effect on the role of religion in Pakistan's state and society is perhaps best anal anal uh, paralleled to Plessy versus Ferguson's impact on the relationship between race and law in the United States. Not only is Mr. Rahman's human rights advocacy unparalleled in Pakistan's recent history, his legal acumen in other areas, including military and criminal law, is highly prized. Indeed, Mr. Rahman's areas of expertise span all areas of Pakistan's constitutional, civil, criminal, and military law, as well as Islamic law and jurisprudence. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Mujib Rahman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> The sponsors of this event <coughs> have done me a great honor inviting me here in this prestigious law school. I have never been in any one of these universities in the West. But all my life, I have enjoyed being in the academic atmosphere. I like young people whenever I go to college or a school or an institution. I feel young once again. But Mr. Bhatti has said many kind words about me. I don't think I deserve all, all of those. But I'm too humble a man to be compared with Thurgood Marshall. He was a great man and a great name in the United States. I am only a humble servant of law. And I have done my bit in 53 years of my professional career as best as I could, but I have not been able to achieve the results at which I want, would have liked to achieve. The reasons may be many, maybe I was a bad lawyer, or maybe the atmosphere in my country was too impervious to hear anything reasonable. But I have not lost hope. And my hope is based on the inherent goodness of man. And I, I in line with some of the American judges, I think Justice Hughes has said once that a dissent in the court of the last resort is an appeal to the intelligence of a future day to the brooding spirit of law. I am hoping for this future intelligence of a future day and I am expecting the brooding spirit of law to awaken one day. Let's hope that it comes. Now, I have been given a subject which says blasphemy, identity, and persecution. Too much seems to have been packed in that one sentence, though these are only three issues mentioned in the title. They involve questions of history, political science, religion, human rights, and in all their various shades. I don't think I can cover all that in the short period that I have at my disposal. But what is central to this blasphemy, identity and persecution, central to this is the Pakistan. It's Pakistan, my country, the country where I come from, the country where I lived my 80 years of my life, the country which I love, the country which has done me many injustices, 
has deprived me of my identity, has tagged a false identity on me. I still respect the constitution of that country. And I, whenever I go, wherever I go, I talk about the constitution of the country. Because the world is a very small place now. The ideas and the thoughts and the interaction of communities, they do change things. In America, things change very fast sometimes. I have been mentioning here in the law schools that way back in 1930s, the, in cases of Jehovah Witnesses, one bench of the Supreme Court of the United States ruled something which curtailed the religious freedom of Jehovah Witnesses. And within a period of three years, the judgment was overturned because the civil society here was wide awake. There is such a great hue and cry that the Supreme Court had to reverse its judgment. That has not happened in my country for the last 40 years. Unfortunate as it is, I still continue to keep my hope alive. Now, when we talk of Pakistan, as I said, Pakistan is, this, is the focal point in this entire talk. My friend Bhatti has given you a fair idea of what kind of persecution is going on and why it is going on and that the persecution is based on the constitutional amendment and it is based in the Ordinance 20 or 298C and 298B of the Pakistan Penal Code. He has given you that picture. I do not want any, uh, to add anything to that. The life of Ahmadi, the, the persecution is so pervasive that it covers the entire life of an Ahmadi from birth to his death. At the time of his birth, we are as Muslims supposed to call Azan in the ears of a newborn child. That is a religious custom, religious rite. I can't do that. At the time of death, any man anywhere in any country is entitled to a decent burial. I do not have that right. And the graves have been disinterred. Bodies have been desecrated, graves have been desecrated right in the eye of the police and the law enforcement agencies. I could give you reasons and could talk about them hours after hours, but that is not what I intend to do here. I'm not here to collect sympathies from, from the American audience at the uh, New York Law School. I'm here to talk of solid constitutional legal issues and their consequences. It is said that in human life, there are no such things as rewards or punishment. There are only consequences of what we do. The constitutional aberrations that we have witnessed, they have had their consequences. And those consequences now are so grave that entire world is engulfed as a result of what has come out of that constitutional amendment in the shape of terrorism and Pakistan has become a breeding ground for terrorist activities. That is because something basically wrong has been done. But my country was not like that from the beginning. The country, the founding fathers of the country did not envision Pakistan as a country of madmen. It did not envision Pakistan as a religious as, as a religious or a theocratic state, they envisioned Pakistan to be a modern democracy. And I say that on the basis of solid historical facts. When India was struggling for independence from the British rule, the Muslims of India, having found it impossible to persuade the Hindu majority to recognize their political and economic rights and to give them a due share in the affairs of the country, the Muslims were forced to a situation where they demanded a separate homeland for Muslims. All Muslims rallied around that demand. But the mainstream clergy, the religious political parties opposed the Pakistan movement to and nail. Majlis Arar, Majlis Jamaat Islami, opposed the creation of Pakistan on some professedly ideological grounds. I will not go into that because that is <coughs> a vast subject, but it needs to be read. It needs to be understood. What I'm trying to highlight here is that the Pakistan movement 
at the very outset, the founding fathers of Pakistan did not envision Pakistan what it is today. The, the poet philosopher who is said to have conceived the idea of Pakistan as a separate homeland in the northwestern part of India. That poet philosopher, let me quote from him, that poet philosopher said in the inaugural session of the Muslim League on 1930, and he said, nor should the Hindus fear that the creation of autonomous Muslim states will mean the introduction of a kind of religious rule in the state. The principle that each group is entitled to free development on its own line is not inspired by the feeling of any narrow communalism. Iqbal was clear it was not going to be a kind of religious rule, kind of religious rule. And most, more importantly, even the people who opposed the Pakistan movement, Maulana Maududi and Harare Islam, they opposed Pakistan on the ground that you are demanding a country for Muslims, a separate homeland. It is not going to be an Islamic state. It is not going to be an Islamic state. Therefore, we oppose it. Maulana Maududi had a different idea that under Islam, nation state is not possible. Islam is universal. So pan-Islamism was his idea. He did not believe in the nation state. RRs had a different idea. But both of them were very clear that Pakistan is not going to be, quote unquote, an Islamic state. So they knew. The, the proponents of the idea knew that it is not going to be an Islamic or a religious state. The opponents of the movement knew that it is not going to be an Islamic state. And when Pakistan came into being, nobody can deny that the name of Islam was the rallying point in the independence struggle. That was the battle cry, separate homeland for Muslims. Muslim, Muslims, Muslim were the focal point. But, when, but everybody knew that it is not going to be what our clerics now want it to be. When Pakistan came into being, I, I am highlighting this thing for a particular purpose. Mr. Jinnah, he said, and he said so in the first session of the Constituent Assembly as a president of the Constituent Assembly of Pakistan. It was not a political speech. He was not addressing a public gathering. He was not trying to appease the masses. He was giving a policy statement at the floor of the Constituent Assembly what the Constitution is going to be. And he said, you are free. You are free to go to your temples. You are free to go to your mosques or any other place of worship in the state of Pakistan. You may belong to any religion or caste or creed that has nothing to do with the business of the state. We are starting in the days there is no discrimination, no distinction between one community and another. No discrimination between one caste, creed or another. We are starting with this fundamental principle that we are all citizens and equal citizens. I emphasize we are all citizens and equal citizens. I am going to address you on this subject. Citizenship is not divisible. You can't divide citizen between this kind or that kind, of this faith or that faith, of this creed or that creed. But the founding father, in the first inaugural speech, he said, all equal citizen. He further said, now I think that we should keep that in mind. And then he goes on to say, and in due course of time, the Muslims would cease to be Muslims, not in the religious sense, because that is the personal faith of an individual, but in the political sense, a citizen of Pakistan. Hindus will cease to be Hindus, Muslims will cease to be Muslims in the political sense, because they are equal citizens. And further, he made it clear, lest there is any doubt, in any case, Pakistan is not going to be a theocratic state to be ruled by priests with a divine mission. Pakistan was never envisioned as such. But somehow, down the road, we lost that vision. It's a long story again. I said the subject includes history, political science, and many, many movements and currents and undercurrents that were going on. I, I will not take you through all them, all of them. 
but there are certain things landmarks the objective resolution which said that the whereas the sovereignty over the of the entire universe belongs to almighty and the alone and then everything it gave the color of an islamic state to start with then in 1953 there were anti ahmadiyya riots then there was an inquiry commission the munir kiani report it is an eye opener i suggest if you get time read that report because when the report was published i remember some of the scholars recommended this as an as a as a must reading and recommended that it should be included in the syllabi of the university why because in that inquiry the court of inquiry questioned each and every scholar of every denomination of muslim faith to to explain what a muslim means who is a muslim to define a muslim and what is an islamic state they did not have a clue they did not agree on the definition of muslim all the clerics and the ulama put together did not agree on the definition of muslim then they did not know what the islamic state is going to be in the modern day they talked of zimmis and the second rate citizens they talked of the rights of minorities not being equal to the and at one point when the court asked a, a scholar of jamaat islami what do you say of mr jinaz in in the inaugural speech he says that was a satanic concept we do not accept that so down the road we have lost that but the watershed came in 1974 when the constitution was amended and here i invite again your i invite your attention again to a very vital constitutional issue i am going to talk of that only on legal grounds not on sentimental grounds i was deeply hurt as i said my identity was taken away from me a label was tagged on me which i did not like i took it at his side but that is not what i am going to talk today i am talking of the pure constitutional issue as a, as a student not as a scholar i am a student i want to remain a student all my life as a student of political science and constitutional law i consider pakistan's second constitutional amendment as a nullity as a worst specimen of tyranny of legislature i consider it a usurpation of the constituent authority i consider it a political heresy and those are not my words let me quote to you from the american jurisprudence james madison he said it's a long quotation and you will find this quotation in the uh, constitutional documents i am only reading two lines in matters of religion no man's right is abridged by the institution of civil, of civil society and the religion is wholly exempt from its cognizance religion is wholly exempt from the cognizance of the civil society of the constitution of the state now justice samuel chase an act of legislature this amendment which declared me not muslim was an act of legislature an act of legislature within brackets for i cannot call it a law he will give you more what is that act of legislature an act of legislature for i cannot call it a law contrary to the first great principles of the special contract can not be considered a rightful exercise of the legislative authority this is samuel chase in my opinion it would be a political heresy samuel chase such a law is not a law cannot be considered a law cannot be considered a rightful exercise of the legislative authority which i called as the usurpation of the constituent function then not only united states in my own area in south asia justice adatullah of indian supreme court he said amending the principles of liberty of individual liberty is a usurpation of constitutional function because 
it is outside the parliament the powers of the parliament this is justice adatullah and based on this i say that the pakistan second amendment was not a valid piece of legislation but it is still on the statute book i has to follow it and as i said it has its consequences i may have accepted it i i took it in a spirit that well if i am not a muslim in the eyes of law and constitution i am quite satisfied if i am accepted as a muslim in with my lord in heaven if i am allowed to practice my faith according to my conscience i do not care what my constitution calls me i took it as that but the clerics would not stop at that they would say we have called them declared them not muslims how come they pray and and practice their faith like a muslim we have to make them convert them into a non muslim i have i have said it elsewhere i don't mind saying it here because that makes the point very clear one of my friends once said it's like saying if you are ill mannered enough to call me a dog you can't expect me to barking like a dog to bark like a dog so that is what the cleric wanted me to do and therefore the clerics the uh, let me again say this this constitutional amendment which mr bhatti has read i need not read it again he said any person who does not believe this this and this shall not be a muslim for the purposes of law and constitution so if the faith of an individual citizen comes within the ambit of a particular phrase he is not a muslim that's it he is not a muslim for the purposes of law and constitution there it stops it does not say that i am not free to act according to my conscience so i continued acting according to my conscience i did not stop praying i did not stop fasting i did not start doing everything which a muslim is required to do under the injunction of quran and sunnah so the clerics ran to courts it's a flood of litigation 35 cases in the province of punjab they were all brought together in the lahore high court and they said they are not muslims they cannot build their mosque like a muslim mosque they cannot build a minaret on it they cannot build a dome on it they cannot pray like a muslim they cannot call their azan as a azan for prayer they they cannot prostrate they cannot uh, uh, ruku sujood and qiyam these which were parts of the namaz they cannot perform that and their therefore their mosque should be taken away or they should be erased destroyed and they should be stopped from doing this a, 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 an injunction was sought declaratory injunction restraining injunction that ahmadis should stop practicing their faith as muslim the case was argued for 14 days at a stretch the argument on the constitutional ground was so compelling that constitution has amended has introduced a definition but it has not amended to article 20 of the constitution which says every citizen is free to profess profess practice and propagate his faith so i am free that argument could not be repelled so therefore the argument on the part of the clerics was they yes constitution is a law but but there is another law known as islamic law and that overrides the constitution and under the islamic law their mosques not only deserve to be demolished they should be converted into filth depot i am saying that within inverted commas this was said in the court in the lahore high court by riyazul hasan gilani who was the attorney general of pakistan for the sharia court should be converted into filth depot and he tried to rely on whatever he had to rely so i was required to argue that religious aspect of the case again i will not take you into that argument it's a very interesting argument if you have time read that judgment abdur rahman mubashshir versus Uh, versus sam gilani uh, 1978 lahore page 230 the court having considered all those arguments considered about 100 years case law of the indian subcontinent and they declared they recognized my religious practices they validated my religious practices they protected my religious practices and they said they cannot be stopped from doing that one of the argument was these practices are the symbol of islam they are islamic symbols they are our rights the court replied 
Yes, these are Islamic symbols, but they are as much the symbols of their faith and they have been practicing and there are many similarities, all the faiths of the world, Christians, Hindu, Christians, uh, Christians, Jews, Muslims, they have many things in common. This is the, the same Abrahamic order. There are many things in common between Jews and Christians and Muslims. So just because my practice is similar to your practice, you cannot say I should be stopped from practicing my faith. That is what the High Court said. And that was it. And they did not deem it expedient to go in appeal. They held their pace for a while and they waited for a martial law. When Jalwa came and he was gasping for his legitimacy, he needed the support of some fundamentalist or the extremist ulama. So he passed what he has stated as Ordinance 20. And Ordinance 20 prohibited all those practices which were validated by the High Court. So what the constitutional amendment could not do, could not do, what the law did not prescribe, what the High Court did not allow, was done by the stroke of a martial law. And if anybody has any doubt, if you read the Ordinance 20, I have read it elsewhere, I will read it here also. He, he has mentioned Article 298B and 298C. Those, those two, uh, the Section 298, 298B and C of the Pakistan Penal Code, they start with the word, any persons of Qadiani group or Lahori group who call themselves Ahmadis shall not call us on. Any person of Qadiani group or Lahori group in both these sections. So the group has been picked up as a community for discrimination. If Azan is called by a Christian, it is not an offense. If it is, it is called by an Ahmadi, it can be punished with three years. And then in the 298C, any person of a Qadiani group and Lahori group shall not pose to be a Muslim. Now, how do you pose to be a Muslim? Just because I'm wearing a beard like a Muslim, I, I pose to be a Muslim? Just because I pray as a Muslim or just because I say Assalamu Alaikum, the normal greeting of a Muslim, I pose to be Muslim. People were sent to jail for three years for greeting another citizen with Assalamu Alaikum, which is a spontaneous greeting in Pakistan. Even Christians would say Assalamu Alaikum, peace be with you. Those of you who understand that and those who belong to that culture of Islam, Islam a man was sent to jail for three years. And he has mentioned other so posed to be I I called that law into question. I challenged that law on two jurisdictions. Individual I personally became a petitioner in the Sharia court because in Sharia court, howsoever good a lawyer I I may or may not have been, I could not appear as a counsel in Sharia court because I am a non-Muslim and it is Islamic Sharia. So I would bring the law. Because the, the law prohibited an Ahmadi from to be, a, to be a lawyer or represent. But law allowed every citizen of Pakistan to challenge a law. So I challenged the law as a non-Muslim citizen. And I was the petitioner and I was my own counsel. I argued the case and uh, argued the case that it is against Quran and Sunnah. Whatever the constitution says, Quran and Sunnah does not prohibit a non-Muslim from calling out Azan. How can you make punishable what is not punishable under Quran and Sunnah? If something is mandated by Quran and Sunnah, how can you make it an offense? If something is recommended by Quran and Sunnah, how can you make it an offense? So it's a long argument. And I said, declare it to be repugnant to Quran and Sunnah because that was what the martial law administration said, a law can be challenged on the ground that it is repugnant to Quran and Sunnah. So it was a long 280 pages judgment. I need not take you through that. But ultimately what the court said, yes, what Mr. Mujibur Rahman is right, says is right, but the ordinance is valid because it is consequential to the constitutional fiat. So as a consequence of the constitution, not talking of Quran and Sunnah, the ordinance is valid. And that court did not pass a unanimous judgment. The Chief Justice did not agree. He was removed from his job. Again, a long story. The case was heard by five judges. A short order was 
signed by five judges. The detailed order was signed by four judges. No mention as to what happened to the fifth judge. Did he earth devour him or did he ascend to heaven? Nothing. What happened to the fifth judge? No mention. And the International Commission of Jurists, when they visited Pakistan, I was talking to them. They were surprised. Where is the opinion of the second judge? I was entitled to I was entitled to know his opinion, even if it was against me. But that opinion was set out. So it was. What I am pointing out is it was a divided judgment, split judgment, a dissent in the court of last appeal. You know, as I as I referred Justice Hughes. Then when I went to Supreme Court. And I said, well, this ordinance is violative of the Article 20 of the Constitution, which gives me religious freedom. So again, there was a long argument. And the court did not say that the ordinance, uh, that this is uh, uh, valid because it, it does not violate my religious freedom. The court said, again, as, as is mentioned, the court said, yes, constitutional fundamental rights are in their place. but." The Islamic provisions override the constitutional provisions. Now that was a fallacy. That was against the Pakistan Supreme Court's own judgment. Because Pakistan Supreme Court, before my case, there was a case known as Hakim Khan. In Hakim Khan's case, this is a long story, very interesting story. I can't narrate you all this. I, I, I could keep you engaged for hours together on that. It's a very interesting story. But before my case, there was a case of Hakim Khan in which the court in nutshell said, Article 2A, that means the Islamic provisions, do not override the provisions of the Constitution. In my case, the court said, Article 2A overrides the constitutional provision. Shortly after my case, there was the case of Nawaz Sharif, the Prime Minister of Pakistan. In that case, again the court says, the uh, uh, Article 2A or the Islamic law does not override. So before me, it does not override. After me, it does not override. For me, there is a narrow window open for me only. And that is what it was. Then, uh, over and above that, they said, well, these, these practices are Islamic practices, and non-Muslim cannot adopt that. And as he said, they tried to use the trademark law. And to quote the judgment, if the, Pep if the Pepsi Cola company, Coca Cola company, can protect their few pennies interest by, uh, by the law of trademark, why can't the Muslims protect their so fundamental rights on that analogy? And I say, well, they, they debase religion to the merchandise, to the commercial activity. Does any man anywhere in the world of any faith hold his faith for a, for a commercial interest, for a monetary benefit? How can you compare religion with merchandise and the monetary benefit? Religion, whatever religion, it speaks of universal truths. Can you, can you claim monopoly on, on, on the third law of motion? Because Newton found it, therefore, no longer I can adopt the new, Newton's third law of motion, universal rule. So that, that, was, the, that, was, that was the Zahiruddin case. So in this way, the life of the Ahmadis became criminalized, as he has said it, on, because the Ordinance 20 was validated. But I have given you the background. Again, this Supreme Court judgment was a divided judgment. And I am living to see whether that judgment is someday overturned. After that, the second subject which you have given me is the identity. You see, the most important part of amendment is that the uh, second amendment by calling me not Muslim, denuded, of, denuded me of my self-identification right. I cannot self-identify myself. I am Mujibur Rahman, you say, no, you are not Mujibur Rahman. I say I am a Muslim, you say, no, you are not, you are not a Muslim. I say I am a Christian, no, you are not a Christian. So my right to self-identify was taken away. But that was not without consequences. That also violated another principle. The first principle that the founding father of the Pakistan constitution said, equal citizens. Citizenship is indivisible. Along with Article 260, sub-Article 3, which defined me, there was another amendment under Article 106 of the constitution, which said the Ahmadis shall be placed in the list of the minorities and one seat in the National Assembly shall be allocated to them, a reserve seat. I was put on the separate electoral roll. I could not contest as an election on a joint electoral list. So I lost my right of franchise. So this only, the, the, this, the identity 
the taking away of the identity and putting a false tag on me took away my right of franchise. And what happens if right of franchise is taken away? You might say, all right, you are not a political man. You are a religious man. Be happy with your God. Why, why talk of political rights? Why talk of franchise? All right, I will not talk of franchise. But it has its consequences. When you divide the Muslims into non-Muslims, you are dividing citizenship. Citizenship, I said, is indivisible. When you divide citizenship, you are creating a great mischief. Because the uh, democracy is inclusive. Democracy is not exclusive. Those special rights given to minorities are supposed to bring them into the mainstream, not to exclude them from the mainstream. Because by some accident of history, some section of the society are left behind and they are termed as a minority. They, spe they, they claim special rights and the law gives them special rights to include them into mainstream. The, in, in, in Southeast Asia now, the books are being written, the, the politics of religious exclusion. Now, what is that religious exclusion? How can you exclude people from mainstream? It is neither political, nor democratic, nor Islamic. But that thing having done now, I am coming to blasphemy. Blasphemy again is a very complicated subject. But I, I want to address you on two, two aspects of that blasphemy. One is the blasphemy law as it is uh, on Pakistan statute book. Under the Pakistan statute, section 295C is the blasphemy law. He said it is punishable with death or imprisonment of life. He is wrong. He is not up to date. The, the life imprisonment clause has been taken away on the judgment of the Sharia court and now the only mandatory sentence is death for defiling the name of the Prophet. And people are being charged on that and the, that law again is so vague and so ridiculous, it is not based on Quran and Sunnah. There is no injunction of Quran and Sunnah which can validate that law. That law is served under the name of Quran and Sunnah, which is a law of the Pakistan statute. It should be open. My, my, my view is it should be open to debate. Any law can be amended or repealed by debate. But this law is not open to debate in Pakistan. A governor of a province was killed and not a finger was raised. That is the kind of situation where Pakistan is now. But that is one aspect of the uh, law in Pakistan. There is another aspect. There are repeated instances of blasphemy, some cartoons here, some film there, which are blasphemous of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu peace be upon him. And the Muslim reaction, the spontaneous Muslim reaction is violent. That violent reaction is against, not based in Quran and Sunnah. Quran has provided a guidance how to react to these. I'll, I'll, I'll quote, don't think that I'm saying it anything of my own. It's not my own doing. I'll quote you verse and chapter to show what is Quranic. Let me, because Muslims had been warned that this is going to happen. The Prophet himself had been warned. The Prophet was warned by God, you have a daunting mission. Don't think it is going to be an easy job. People are going to ridicule you. People are going to insult you. That is what has happened with every, every Prophet through the ages. So, oh Muhammad, it is a daunting job. So what, what should you do? And Quran has listed the instances of blasphemy committed in his face. And the Prophet did not take any action. So what is the guiding, gu guiding rule? The guiding rule is, I am reading chapter 3, verse 187. You shall surely be tried in your possession and in your person. And you shall surely hear many hurtful things. You will surely hear many hurtful things from those who were given the book before you and from those who set up equals to God. But if you show fortitude and act righteously, that indeed is a matter of strong determination. So number one, strong determination is required. It is a daunting task. Chapter 3, verse 201. O ye who believe, be steadfast and strive to excel in steadfastness and be on your guard and fear Allah that you may prosper. The word excel reminds me of your motto. 
protect and excel. Excel in everything good, excel, excel in virtue. Then chapter 41 verse 35, and good and evil are not alike, they cannot be same. Good and evil are not alike, repel evil with that which is best. Do not repel evil with evil. Repel evil with that which is best. And what will be the consequence? Quran says. Repel evil that which is best. And lo, he between whom and thyself was enmity will become as a bosom friend. If you show patience, you can win your friends and they can become, your enemies can become friends. That is what Quran teaches me. Chapter 73 verse 11. And bear patiently all they say and withdraw from them. So if you cannot tolerate what is being done, withdraw from the company. Don't sit in the company. But don't react violently. That is not what Quran says. So that is the teaching of Quran. Having said that, let me remind you of what President Eisenhower said in one of, the, oh, in one of his sessions. Because sitting in America, if I own, quote only Quran, that will not help. So let, let me, but before I quote President Eisenhower, let me make a remark. All these great people, Ram Chandra, Krishna, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. They are the salt of earth. They are the pride of humanity. Howsoever you may ridicule them and insult them. If you spit on the sun, it will going to be revert back to your own face. Nobody can harm them. Those beautiful countenances cannot be clouded by any amount of dust raising. And therefore, who would, who would blaspheme them? For why? It needs a madman to do that. But still it is done and not by madmen. Absolutely sane and sensible people. Why? So we have to consider that. So on that, you can at least agree with me whether you agree with me on the rest of my talk or not, you can agree, at least agree with me that blasphemy, and mark my words, blasphemy, it is at odds with civil behavior. It is at odds with civility. If you expect civil behavior, why should you expect blasphemy? But unfortunately, that is done. He says, I have left with five minutes, but I, I understand I can go beyond 5.30, a few minutes, I, I will not hold you long, but uh, I will go beyond 5 minutes, but I will I, finish my talk just now. So that, uh, it is at odds with civility. And the response of the Muslims is very violent. That response I said is wrong. But what about the other side? Eisenhower said, President, uh, President Eisenhower in one of his speeches, and I, I think it was one of those uh, Ignore, uh, uh, inaugural speeches where he said and he talked of a very great principle and that is and I leave that that thought with you the verses of the Quran and the saying of Eisenhower these two thoughts I'm going to leave with you people that value its privileges above its principle soon lose both if I value my privileges more than principles, my privileges, I am free to speak. Who can take away freedom of speech? The only thing which distinguishes a man from the lower animal is his capacity to speak. Quran says, Allah mahol bayan. We have taught him to speak. So speech is the basic quality. Who can restrict my speech? I am free to speak. That is true. That is my privilege, my right. But anybody who values his principle more, values his privilege more than a principle, soon bound to lose both. That is what President Eisenhower says. So therefore, those who say that, those who claim unrestricted right, I, I was reading way back, I, I, I was defending a, a defamation case, a criminal case, slender. I was studying the law of slender as, as, as practiced in England. So I went to Halsbury's Laws of England. And Halsbury's Laws of England tells me that at one point of time, the slander was a part of the law of breach of peace. Slander is not only being uncivil to another person. Slander is, can sometimes break peace. 
and sometimes even world peace. So why can't we bring out a balance between the two? That is the last word I have to say. Thank you. We would like to now open the floor up for questions. Uh, please feel free to ask Mr. Rahman whatever you'd like. So you tried the constitution, you tried the Sharia, and uh, apparently none, none of them worked. So what's the solution? The solution is you, the world community. My country cannot live in isolation. If the, I'm, I'm moving around the academia. If the intellectual atmosphere around the world were to raise their voice and were to, I mean, don't raise it for my sake. Raise it for the sake of humanity. Raise it for the sake of reason and law. If the, if the law schools all over the world were to, were to speak with one voice that this is an abomination, this cannot be tolerated. I don't say but not tolerating. I, I don't say take away the rights of Pakistan. But if an intellectual voice is raised, they, somebody is bound to hear. But as I said, I am waiting for the brooding spirit of law to awake. I am waiting for the intelligence of a future day. And my future are the young people here and young people in Pakistan. As I said, I, I, I like being in the young, uh, company of young people. It makes me young once again. So my hope, my hope is revived. So my hope is in the world community and the world awareness needs to be created. The entire world does not know what is happening to me. Who would approve that I should not call out God is one, God is one, God is the greatest, God is the greatest, that is punishment. Who, who, who would approve that? Nobody would, but the world does not know what is happening. So if there was greater awareness, maybe the, the voice of the world conscience. The world conscience is my hope. Uh, the lady there perhaps wanted to ask one. Uh, give, her the, give her the mic. At the beginning you were mentioning that uh, Ahmadis are prosecuted all over the world. So I was uh, hoping if you could just elaborate on the same. And also I would like to ask about like the civil society movement in Pakistan in support of Ahmadis. Ahmadis, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm so sorry. Uh, is it only uh, strictly re restricted to Ahmadis in, uh, in general or is there like another section of uh, society that is also like... So yeah, you see, I, I, that's a very good question. I think many things have to be curtailed uh, in view of the watch that I, clock that I keep on looking at. So I could have addressed that earlier. It's good that you asked that question. The, 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 this, this attitude of law has bifurcated the society, fragmented the society. For instance, the separate electorate. If uh, there are separate electorate, why would a man go to ask for a vote to a Christian or a, or, or a Hindu or a Sikh? So the society, one on this side, one on the other side. So there is no interaction. The solidarity is broken. Fragmented society, number one. Then as a result of that, that opening, that opening which door was opened for religious madness. And that madness had converted Pakistan into a breeding ground of terrorism. So the whole world is being affected by that. And that is the, and it is not me. Many people in the civil society in Pakistan are saying that the Second Amendment was the root cause of this religious extremism in Pakistan. So I, I said there are consequences. Nobody can do a thing. And there is a saying of the Prophet that the, the, that the wrong actions of the great people cause greater harm. If I commit a mistake, it doesn't harm anybody. If a leader commits a mistake, it harms the entire nation. And when the constitution commits a mistake, the entire community, the entire country is harmed. So that is what is happening. So the entire country is affected. And as a result of that, Shias are being targeted, Christians are being targeted, and blasphemy law is being abused. Why would a man go and burn a Christian church? What harm has been done to him? Just because somebody wants to grab that land? So the law is abused. And there is no way how to stop it. I challenged the law on the, on the ground that it was too vague and overbroad. And you as law students would know a law which is vague and overbroad is not a law. It is ever overturned. In a, any American Supreme Court will overturn that law which is vague and overbroad. So that vagueness in the blasphemy law is create, create, creating that heaven. And even between Muslims. Muslims are being punished under the blasphemy law. Not because a Muslim would consciously commit an act of blasphemy. But because he happens to have annoyed another person or a big person or maybe, or maybe a more uh, rude person. And so he, he makes an excuse of blasphemy and when and, bless, and <laughs> interestingly when a charge of blasphemy is leveled and you ask him what is the evidence 
and the answer would be enjoy it answer would be i can't repeat because repeating blasphemy is blasphemy <laughs> that is what happened. okay any other question yes yes uh, is there any other modality like hindus or my faith and sin area and the fear of threat of criticism or Well, I I would not make a sweeping statement. Hindus are migrating. Some Christians, though in very small number, they have migrated. Ahmadis are migrating. They find they find their life almost impossible. I would not leave my country. I will live there. I live and die there. That is why I intend to do. But when I, when the law was passed, you will enjoy that. Let me tell you that story. I was arguing the court in Lahore High Court. I have been deprived my right to call azan. and there was an elderly lawyer a very great lawyer the advocate general of the province of punjab he said are there many people who understand urdu or punjabi some of you understand that he said i'll translate that he said mujibur rahman ki hoya azana saadiyan namazan todiyan why are you worried we are not going to pray we'll call out the azan and you can pray so azan for us and namaz for you so that was the attitude i mean people ridiculed that law but now the child who goes to the primary school in the nursery classes the syllabus includes hate material against ahmadis and christians non muslims are something untouchable that hatred i mean the, those syllabi are are being polluted and and poisoned that is what is happening in pakistan and that needs the world conscious needs to talk about it any other question yes uh firstly thank you so much for being here um you narrated verses from the quran uh holding that uh, violent reactions to blasphemous uh, depictions of prophet muhammad are uh you know not have not been depicted in the quran itself can you tell me personally as to why would there be such a derogation from the quran when there's such a stated verse um why is there such a derogation by the judiciary as well as in practice maybe by muslims no, i did not follow your question sorry um you said you i quoted from quran yes then, you holding that fortitude is required yes. or you do not repeal evil by evil um so why is there a derogation in practice with the judiciary and with uh, yes i so if quran says all that why those who believe quran should act against it that's your question yeah i mean i, I why, think why should the they basic, not follow quran that's, why, why that's should the they basic not question that you see there arrive. are uh, there are many arguments again that is a subject of islamic jurisprudence i have i have uh, spent quite a few years trying to understand that problem you see blasphemy is never never and i say it very uh, strongly is never a religious issue as i said it is abused it has been abused from the times from the early very early times it was sometime blasphemy is committed during the life of the prophet blasphemy was committed to silence that voice that heavenly voice but that violent voice could not be silenced so that spread and when that voice spread then the people who at that time committed blasphemy and became muslims they would not tolerate blasphemy because of some of their own political motives so when the there were the tyrant uh, rulers and all that in order to preserve their rule they would punish people on the charges of blasphemy because blasphemy was expanded you will be surprised to hear what what constitutes blasphemy in the in the islamic jurisprudence i will ask some some of your maulana i am not telling you a lie it says if in the presence of somebody holy prophet uh, somebody says that holy prophet used to like the pumpkin as a vegetable whatever you call it what do you call it as pumpkin or something any squash so, so, so uh, holy prophet liked that vegetable and i say no what trash that is not a vegetable i don't like it i commit blasphemy if prophet liked it and i don't like it i commit blasphemy that is written in the books so it has been extended that far and on a on a higher level amongst the muslims there are people who believe that prophet was 
a human. We all believe Muhammadan Abduhu wa Rasulo. He is the servant of God and his prophet. So he was human. So human par excellence. Best of humans. But still a human. But there is another section who says, no, he was not human. He was light. How can he be human like us? Quran says, I am a human, I am a man like unto you, except that revelation is sent to me, otherwise I am a man like you. And the other man says, no, no, no. Quran says, he was light. So, one of them is committing blasphemy. If I am reducing that high status of human prophet to a human prophet, I am committing blasphemy. So, Muslims are all, so all these things are used as an excuse for some political motives. Any other questions? So, follow up question? yeah, yeah, follow up question. Um, so, from what you're saying is that, like the society in itself, like your neighbors, they're most likely they're fine with you to be a, a Ahmadi, but it's the system that has actually motivated these the people to rise up against you, yeah. against your community, and also the idea of extreme. extreme extremism to be used in uh, places like Afghanistan and Kashmir to protect the Pakistani identity as a state. Would you agree with that statement? I mean, th th this is a very broad subject, but to protect the Pakistan identity as a state or not, uh, the, the Kashmir issue is more complicated. Kashmir issue has, you know, what is so concerning, what is it that so concerns the Pakistani population? and. There is no doubt that there is a military dimension to that. All our rivers flow from Indian Kashmir. And today we find that some of the dams are being built, turning our rivers into barren land. That is one fear. Under the international law, there was a treaty, Indus Basin Treaty, water treaty, according to which water of Indus Basin was given to Pakistan and some, some rivers were given to India. So, if we follow the treaty, there is no problem. But there is a fear. Then there is another fear. And because Pakistan is feel, and now I am not entering into a political dialogue, a discussion here. But Pakistan's view is that the Kashmir's annexation with India was the instrument of annexation was a fake instrument. The Maharaja did not accede to India. That document was forcibly got from, gotten from him, and then therefore, it, it, and therefore they say they, let, let let there be a plebiscite. So there was a United Nations resolution that there, there should be plebiscite. That plebiscite, plebiscite India is not doing. But there are many people who think that now so much time has passed. Let us think of a solution out of the box. Now those are political talks. I am not going into that. I am at the moment talking of persecution, whether it is in occupied Kashmir by Hindus against Muslims or whether it is in, in Pakistan by Muslims against Hindus and Christians, I condemn hum, violation of human rights anywhere. <coughs> yes? Uh, so there are obvious human rights violations occurring in Pakistan. So how has the international, international community tried to rectify, rectify the situation and create awareness? You see, uh, we keep on trying and sometime there were House concurrent resolution in the United States Congress that creates a voice. Sometime the issue was tabled at the uh, Human Rights Commission in Geneva. That voice has an effect. So that has a restraining effect. But you know the international uh, political levers and the political language is always so diplomatically couched and they cannot put pressure beyond a limit. Because I, I would not uh, uh, support if there was to be a sanction against Pakistan on that ground. As a citizen, it would hurt me and it would hurt the poor people of my country if sanctions are placed in Pakistan. So maybe to, to, do, to go to that extent may not be possible. But nevertheless, uh, the, human, uh, the international voice counts and they, it has a restraining effect. So the human rights watch and human rights organization all over the world, in Pakistan civil society, they keep on raising voice. So uh, it is for that reason only that every now and then there is some slowing down, then again it comes up. So it's an ongoing process and we need to keep on working. 
So let me tell you once again, it has been a great pleasure for me. And a player is also derived from the fact that so many people in the United States who have not seen Pakistan are interested in hearing about Pakistan and they have heard me for about an hour. Thank you very much. I am leaving with a heart full of gratitude. Thank you.